Revelation chapter 3 is where we are this morning. Jesus is dictating letters to seven different churches in Asia Minor, what the Bible refers to as Macedonia. These two represent the last two. And if we apply the notion that these letters represent church history, the different eras down through the history of the church then, the church of Philadelphia and the church in Laodicea would represent the last day's church. If that's true, then this is where we are, because many of us think we are getting very close, if not in, the last day. So Jesus is dictating letters to these churches that will be here near the time of his return, or at least our exit out. And that's where we'll begin our study next week. You'll not want to miss next Sunday, because we get into Revelation chapter 4, after these things are the first words in chapter 4. After these things refers to what? Perhaps the era of these letters. If that's true, then Ephesus represents the apostolic church, the beginning of the church. And each consecutive letter represents a time period. So now Philadelphia, Jesus doesn't have any problems with the church in Philadelphia. He commends them on every level. Hopefully that's us, that Jesus looks at us this way. Not so much so in the last letter, which we're getting to in just a moment. So if you'll open up to chapter 3, verse 7 is where we're going to begin this morning. Quote, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes... I will make him a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Jesus repeats again what he has said in each of these letters. Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I misquoted. Not listen, hear. The biblical de definition of hear is hear and do. Hear, O Israel, in Deuteronomy. God expects us not just to listen to his words, but hear them, understand them, and then obey him, which is what the church in Philadelphia was doing. They were listening to the Spirit of God, they were hearing the commands of God, and they were participating in the will of God in their city. Again, Jesus says, I know, I know. I want to repeat that so much that when you leave 
and you're driving home, you say to yourself, Lord, thank you that you know what I'm going through. Because it seems like nobody else understands really what's going on inside me. But I become convinced by listening and reading your word that you know and you care about what's happening in my life. Thirdly, in this letter and in the last one, he mentions you're an overcomer. That has been identified, defined, described by John in 1 John chapter 5. You are the one who accepts Jesus. You are the one who did not follow the spirit of the Antichrist and deny Jesus came because you accepted, believed, have faith and trust in Jesus, you are an overcomer. And to you, Jesus says in the church of Philadelphia, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. But I get ahead of myself as I am prone to do. Verse 7. These things says he. So Jesus identifies himself again, quite uniquely and differently than before. He who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. It seems to me Jesus is reassuring the church in Philadelphia, perhaps you this morning, that he has been given all authority in heaven and earth. He is the ruler over everything and everyone. We just sang, we shall crown him with many crowns. Jesus is the king of kings. The world may seem like it's in chaos and nobody's in charge, but that is not true. God is still on his throne. Jesus still has authority over all. The men who went through the Bible study on Thursday wrestled with that. In Romans chapter 13, when we talked about what God said through Paul about being submissive to the government, the leaders in our government, because they were appointed and ordained by God. And we're looking around each other around that table next door, and we're going, huh? Well, if this is true, and then finally the men got together and said, it must be true, because that's what the Bible says. Therefore, we had to align our thinking to God's thinking with a renewed mind, chapter 12. You see what Jesus is saying to the church in Philadelphia, to the church sitting here this morning? I am in charge. And if I open a door, it's open. In fact, that's the next verse. I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and I have kept my word. No, excuse me. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. So that open door appears to be multifaceted. Jesus says, I've opened a door. You walk through. I opened a door to ministry and you accept it. I opened a door to faith and trust and salvation you received. I opened a door to be here this morning and you came. He who hears and reads these words is blessed. That's what we began with in chapter one. You're going to leave today blessed because you saw an open door, you came in and you're resting in Jesus. You're hearing the word of God. You shall be blessed by that. So as you leave, remember that as you go your way. So God says, my son has all authority. If he opens a door, nobody can shut it. So if that door represents your salvation, nobody can take it away. Nobody can take you out of the hand of Jesus, not even yourself. That's assurance of salvation. Does your assurance mean that you can go out and sin all you want? No, the Bible says no. 
but rather it's motivation to live a holy life because you're in God's hand. So Jesus says to the church, I know who you are and what you're putting up with. And he continues on verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Isn't that interesting? There's a synagogue of Satan in Smyrna, but in that city, those in that synagogue, that assembly of followers of Satan, they will cause harm even imprison the saints in Smyrna. But in Philadelphia, not so. Jesus is saying, look, you will watch them come and bow down before you and worship you? No, worship Jesus. I will make them come down and bend their knee and worship me in front of you. That's how much the door is opened to you. Now, don't get carried away with that. Say, well, I just can't wait <laughs> until I'm in charge and watch them come down and bend their knee before me. Know this. That may be what they're doing, but they're not worshiping you. They're bending the knee before God Almighty. And just be thankful you're not in Smyrna. And this takes place. Verse 10. I want them to know that I loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Wow. Wow. Jesus is forecasting what's going to start to take place in chapter 4 and onward. Jesus is forecasting to the church of Philadelphia, to you, that when the time comes for the people on earth to be tested, to be judged, I will spare you. Now, there's two different opinions, perhaps more, but at least two, on the meaning of this text. One is, the church will be gone when that testing begins. The rapture will have already taken place. Therefore, that will be how God protects us from the testing that is coming, the wrath that is coming, the judgment that is going to arrive perhaps soon. The second opinion is, it's more like the Israelites in Egypt. When the plagues came upon Egypt, God protected his people from the effects of those plagues. That we may be here when some of these events happen, but God will protect us. It takes serious Bible study to discern which of those two is correct and does one eliminate the other. It could be they're overlapping, couldn't it? that God is protecting you now with all the stuff that's going on. And you may not realize you're being protected because that's just how God works. Amen. I don't know how you think, but there's been many times, I'll give you an example. I was leaving the coffee shop down here after men's prayer breakfast. Did you know after we pray, we go have breakfast? I'm at the stoplight that, and I'm facing the Safeway place. And all of a sudden, the radio was too loud, and I turned it off, not realizing the light had turned green, and I started to go, and here comes a big 18-wheeler. And I thought, whoa. Because normally I'm right there. So God says, I'm going to make this. I don't know what he did. I just know that I didn't get crunched. So there's a lot of time God protects us, and I don't think we realize it. I think there's a lot of times we just, because we kept his word, we didn't deny him, 
we're just be, trying to be faithful. And he says, I got you. I got your six. Just go out there and serve me. I got it covered. I love you. And I want them, your enemies, to know how much I love you. I love you. I will keep you. I will judge them and I'll spare you. Next verse. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. There's a lot of debate on what Jesus means by I am coming quickly. Clearly, it doesn't mean soon. Would you agree? This was written before the end of the first century and Jesus still has not come back because if he has come back, then we've been left behind and we deserve what we get. I don't think he has come, do you? No. So it doesn't mean soon. Here's what I think it means, and you can do your own study and verify. I'm not giving you any further warnings. You have my words from Genesis to this passage right here. I have told you over and over again what's going to happen when I return. Be ready. No further warnings will be given. I am coming quickly. Now, that's my personal take on what it means. Another interpretation is, I'm coming without hesitation, meaning when I come, I'm coming. And when I come, I'm coming quickly when I come. And everybody will know it when I come. The clouds will roll back, and I'm on my way. Next verse. Well, let's finish this one. Hold fast that no one may take your crown. If you study the New Testament, you will notice that there's five crowns that God has promised to believers. They're identified and defined in the Bible. I think that this one is the crown of life, crown of righteousness. You hang in there, you hold fast, you trust in me, and nobody will be able to take your righteousness from you. Jesus often uses physical realities, crown, to try to explain a spiritual truth, righteousness. This is what the kids next door are trying to wrap their young little minds around. Jesus is sinless, and because he's sinless, he's qualified to die for your sins and give you his righteousness, his sinlessness. Can you imagine being seven and trying to comprehend that? God bless our teachers because that's laying the foundation so when next year and the year after that, they're reading a verse like this and go, oh, I got it. that's one of the crowns. Let's go on. We ever talked about this before. I can hold fast. I'm, I have my assurance. So that's the point that Jesus has made. Hang in there. I love you and you know it. I've got you. Because you're an overcomer. You didn't deny me. You're not following the Antichrist. You're following me. And I'm going to treat you well. I'm going to make you a pillar in my dad's, not dad, my God's temple. And he concludes like he normally does. Listen Hear the Spirit. In my notes, I have listened because in our world, we use hearing and listening differently than Scripture. I'll give you an example. A husband and wife are having a conversation. Ring a bell? And the wife says to the husband, Are you listening to what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Did you hear what I said? Oh. Could you repeat it? See, we use it the other way around. The Bible says, hear. One more example and move on. When a dad says to his misbehaving children, listen to your mother. That's not what he means. 
He does not mean to that child who isn't doing what mom said for the umpteenth time. What he means is, don't make me get out of this chair. <laughs> you go do what your mother said. Because if I get out of this chair, the belt is coming off. Now, none of that is spoken out loud, right? It's inferred with, listen to your mom. That's similar to what God is saying. Do you hear the Spirit? Uh Uh-huh. Do you hear the Spirit? Yes, sir. Then do what he says. Now to the other church. Verse 14. Follow along in your Bible as we read about the Laodicean church. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works that you are neither hot, cold, nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you notice how he closes every letter? To the churches. He is not talking to the world. He's talking to us. These words are written to us, the church. We who believe. Not for them. So to the Laodicean church, he says, I am the Amen. So be it. I am the one who's at the end of each of your prayers. I'm the one who answers your prayers. I am the one who hears your prayers. I am the amen. I am the faithful and true witness. I am faithful and I am true. And I'm here to testify, says Jesus, that I have all authority on heaven and earth. I am in control and you're in my care. Lastly, I am the beginning of the creation of God. Did you see that? Jesus is saying, I am the beginning of creation of God. I was there at the beginning of creation of God. I am personally the beginning of creation of God. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. I was there, says Jesus. John in his gospel says it a little differently. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. He's reiterating that in this exhortation to the church in Laodicea. These things, says the Amen. Verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, I want to insert something here that will be helpful in further study. 
Over and over again, Jesus is telling the church, I know your works. I know what's going on. He is not saying, I'm causing this to happen. See, God's knowing isn't the cause. It's his omniscience, his knowing. So God is not causing the Laodiceans Laodiceans to be lukewarm. He is saying, I know you are. And there's a reason you are, and he's going to admonish them for that. Now, the part that I cannot explain is his words before that. I wish you were cold or hot. Why would Jesus say, I wish you were cold or hot? Wouldn't he want us to be hot towards him, on fire, passionate for him, not just eh toward him? The only thing I came up with, and I need your help in testing this theory, is it has to do with your works not your faith. It has to do with what you're doing. I wish you had more passion. Another way of saying it is, I think, Jesus is saying, I don't want fence sitters. I don't want you sitting there saying, well, I wish I could. If I would, I could. Maybe I might. You're either in or you're out. I think Jesus is saying, you're either with me or you're against me. I think that's what he's saying. Make up your mind. Don't be lukewarm. If you're lukewarm, I will, I like the King James Version better, I will spew you out. (laughs) Vomit sounds pretty gross to me. (laughs) That assumes that I'm way down there deep and go, Jesus, I got to get rid of Nolan now. (laughs) Maybe. I don't think so. But what he's saying is he's using a physical reality to explain a spiritual truth. You're unpleasant to me, those of you who are lukewarm. Be one or the other. Now I know you have read commentaries that say what Jesus is actually saying is that in this part of the country, the water that was in their household, not plumbed in, but the water they got, was neither cold nor hot. It was lukewarm because of the springs and the hot, blah, blah, blah. Fine. If that's true, and it probably is, Jesus is borrowing from that to say, this is what I want from you. I don't want you blah. I want you in. I want you to hear what the Spirit says. I want you to be doing my Father's will. I want you to be doing the things that I have called and spiritually equipped you to do. Do those things. And watch me bless you in the doing. How many of you have ever gone to go visit somebody who's a shut-in or at the hospital or wherever, and you're driving in thinking, I really don't want to do this. I have been to this place before, and it smells funny. So all the way there, you're thinking, well, I can't get out of it. I'll just go. And then you're driving home thinking, I am so glad I went. Because the person you visited just brightened your day. You thought you were going to go in there and cheer them up, and the opposite happened. They're laying in this bed, and you're thinking they're sick and on the verge of, and they're going, well, how are you doing? You came here to see me? Well, thank you. How's your day going? I'm going, wait a minute. This is reverse. This is backwards. See, that's the way God works. He just makes it happen when we think it's going the other way around, but I digress. Now, verse 17. He's going to confront their lie. You say I'm rich and I don't need anything. But what you don't know is, listen to the list. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Now those are physical things that we can relate to, but they're spiritual truths. 
I don't think they're literally without clothes. I think they're more like Adam and Eve in the garden when they realize, oops. Adam and Eve put on fig leaves. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that was? How many have picked figs? You know how itchy those leaves are? Ew. And God comes along and says, oh, let me give you some lamb's wool to wear. That, that's just bad. Now, that's not in the Bible. I just made that up. <laughs> but here are these people in Laodicea saying, I've got all I need. I don't need God. And, and God is saying, there's one thing you don't have, and that's me. Come buy from me. The very next verse. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may clothe, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Well, Jesus is not in the retail business. He's using their economic status Historians say that these people were famous for their ointments, especially their eye salve. And Jesus uses that very thing. They had become quite wealthy because of exporting these ointments that they produced. And Jesus is saying, you have that, but you're blind. Why? Because you didn't come to me. I'm the one that gives sight to the blind. You're naked in your sin and you're trying to cover it up with your fine clothing when I can give you what? Righteousness. Garments of righteousness. You think you're rich, but I can give you treasures in heaven. Up here, says Jesus, we pave the streets in gold. We walk on it. It's pavement up here. It's like the guy that got met at the pearly gates and he had a whole box of gold. You heard this one? I'm sure you have. I don't know any new ones. <laughs> and St. Peter says, what do you got there? He goes, I got gold. You brought pavement? <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Leave that. And Jesus is saying the same thing to these people. You think you have it all, but you have nothing. Let me clothe you that the shame of your nakedness, the shame of your sin, may not be revealed. Let me cover that. Now here's the truth of it. As it was in the garden, as it was on the cross, as it was for you, it's the blood of Jesus that covers the sin, that atones for the sins that we have. Not some white garment, not some special robe, not some special suit, not a gold tie. It is the blood of Jesus that washes us like white linen. It's his righteousness that he gives to us. That's what we're trying to teach our kids next door. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Ouch. Some of you sitting in this room are kind of like me. God must really love you. <laughs> huh? Having more trips to the woodshed, do you think God's going to take me before I get it? I already have a sign from one of my lovely sisters in this church that it hangs in my garage and it says, Beware, you may, beware of flying tools. Because I've confessed my frustration 
in my garage. And I know whose fault it is. It's me. I'll use something and I won't put it back where it belongs. And when I can't find it because I haven't put it back, I blame somebody else. Who's been in my garage? <laughs> you know why I own a dozen tape measures? Because I can never <laughs> find one. So I buy another one. And I got a whole drawer of tape measures. But why am I confessing my sins? You're laughing because you're just as guilty, aren't you? <laughs> and God says, get rid of that. Let that go. That's behind you. Come to me, says the Lord. And let me chasten you, rebuke you. Without coincidence, and not ironically, God has Paul write that exact same thing to Timothy. Did he not? 2 Timothy 3.16. For all scripture is inspired, right? I have it written down to make sure I get the quote exactly right. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So how does God correct us? How does he rebuke us? How does he equip us to righteousness? So he doesn't come to us traveling to Prescott on the highway and have some idiot cut you off. That's not his correction. That's Nolan's test. So if you see a blue Chevy with a blue camper on it, avoid that guy. He's nuts. <laughs> so what God is saying to us this morning, look, I love you and I will correct you. And all the parents in the room know exactly this, don't we not? Do we not? We do. We know it. I don't know about you, but I made the same mistake my parents did. I went to one of my children and I said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> huh? That's never true. Maybe on a spiritual level, but not physically. Even if you just ground your kids, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? So God is saying to his children, I will do what it takes to correct you, to put you back in the middle of the straight and narrow, because I love you. Not because I'm mean, because I love you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This, has, this goes with the previous sentence. This is not an evangelistic verse. This has to do with the previous sentence. Therefore, be zealous and repent. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. He is saying that to the person that he's correcting. Repent. Let me in. Now, I know you've seen paintings of Jesus knocking on the door and it has no door handle. I see the point, but they didn't have door handles at this time. There was no schlag there where you can turn and walk in. But in the painting, there's no handle on the Jesus side of the door, right? suggesting that he's not going to open the door himself, but the handle's on the other side of the door you can't see. Have you heard this one? And you have to let him in because that's just the way it works. Oh, hi, Lord. Oh, come on in. Yeah, I got it. I don't know, but Jesus is saying to those of us in this church, to probably more than a few, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. I've been chastening you. I've been chasing you. I've been correcting you. Let's dine together. Let's fellowship. 
Let's have a conversation. Yes, Lord. And then do that for somebody else. Let's sit down and have a talk. Tell me what's going on. Let me listen to what's happening in your life. See, that's how people are convinced. Not with a debate, not with an argument, but with a conversation. I close with this example because, I don't know about you, I am sick and I am tired of our current political atmosphere. The mudslinging has gotten to the point it is absolutely childish. What happened to the era where people who disagree sit down and just have a conversation? A debate is not a conversation. A debate is where I'm right, you're wrong, and you will listen to me until it's your turn to tell me I'm wrong. And Right, Trav? That's how a debate works. A conversation is this. What's going on? What's happening? Are we okay? Let's get it resolved. As Dwayne and the team come up, ask yourself this towards God. Lord, are we okay?